Hey everybody, it's Dave Dugdale, learningdslrvideo.com. It's about a month ago, JJ from ASUS came out and helped me build this computer behind me. Um, it, we, he was here for like two days. I recorded like three hours of content and I got some great raw footage of him putting it together. Um, if you watched the previous video I did on this, it was pretty much a, a you know, a recap of how it was built. But what I thought, um, cause he had to pull all the, the stuff out of this computer, the, the CPU and the motherboard and bring it back with him. Um, and I'm just getting that stuff now. And I had to go watch the raw material of him putting it together. Um, because I couldn't remember how to do it because like the CPU does it go this way or does it go this way you know with the lettering upside down I remember he explained all that stuff so I was watching the the, the playback and I know a lot of this raw information was really good that I didn't include in my original video so this is all new material I don't know what I'm gonna do is probably break this up into three parts this will be part one of three um, this will be about a half hour long of him talking uh, actually, I was just peppering with questions just left and right. It was fantastic. A lot of times you'll see my camera work is terrible because I'm so interested in the answer and I'm like moving the monopod around with the A7S. You're going to see rolling shutter issues. You're going to see me like not focusing very quickly because I am not get, haven't gotten used to the uh, focus peaking at that point with that camera. Um, but I think there's a lot of great information here. And I think if you... Even think of yourself as a computer genius and you know everything, I guarantee you're gonna learn at least one tidbit of information about building a computer uh, on this. So here we go, let's go. So, you know, this is kind of one thing too a lot of people sometimes wonder about is you generally wanna to try to remove the retention plate or this cover plate, not when actually the retention plate is still down. Because when you do that, sometimes people will pull outwards but when they pull outwards, there's the tendency for the finger to go down. Mm -hmm. And with the downward motion, you end up slightly maybe, you know, hitting one of the pins and you end up bending it. So it's always best when you actually bring it back out, you take it out at the top when it's actually exposed, when it's raised. This one's kind of interesting too with this new CPU design. Um, the CPU, the writing actually will be upside down versus right side up. So it's kind of like an easy trait because sometimes people, they can't tell exactly the notches and they go down, but sometimes their dexterity isn't that great so that when they actually put the CPU down, when they have to pull back up, if they've inserted it to the wrong, uh, if they've inserted it incorrectly, then actually same thing, they pull out and they end up dropping it and bending the pins. But if you're looking at the writing actually on the CPU, you'll see that the writing is right here. It's actually going to be upside down as opposed to right side up. I don't know if you can notice it through the thermal compound. Yeah, I know. Because okay. everything you're dealing with is so easy to drop. Sometimes this stuff is so small, that's the last thing you want to do. I don't want to drop any of it. But here, let me get this off just so we can actually see the writing a little bit more clearly. I don't want to take too much of it off because we need a little bit for that thermal compound that we don't have. Can you see it there? Yeah, hold it real still. Yeah, now I can see it. Okay. So you can see there how the actual the writing is actually upside down. Upside down. Gonna put that retention lever down. This was probably a nervous part for you when you did oh, this. Oh, I did it, and it helped. Yeah. Every the resistance is entirely normal. Yeah, you're good. You can go. All right. Yeah. So we're just gonna go ahead and push down, and then we're gonna push inwards, and we're gonna allow it to go ahead and go in. Same thing, that one, and we're good to go. But the resistance is entirely okay. So that's so this CPU specifically we're using it's the 5960X. So this is the Extreme Edition. So this is the highest end CPU that Intel will offer right now for the X9i platform. So that's going to be base, eight core, sixteen thread part, twenty megabytes of cache, forty PCI Express lanes, uh, and it is an unlocked part. So unlocked means that it does support overclocking. So um, maximum frequency that the part would offer would be three point three gigahertz but uh, we can easily exceed that. Even on uh, what we refer to as kind of the most modest, uh, capably enabled CPUs, you're gonna at least be targeting about four to 4.1. So uh, there's quite a bit of headroom actually in the part. Better CPUs um, with good quality cooling uh, and depending on ultimately what's referred to as the margin of the CPU. So some CPUs are a little bit better than others. Um, actually can get to ranges of 4.2 to as much as 4.6. So, you know, the most immediate benefits come into that there's a lot of complex architecture that's gone into this, but pretty much it allows us to have much faster speeds at lower voltages, which just gives, actually gives us better power consumption. So your wattage, especially when you're heavily utilizing a system, 
the more that you're loading anything, the more power it consumes. So you can imagine on very big memory installations, we're now going to be able to have those same memory installations at faster speeds, um, but have them actually consume less power, produce less heat. So all the way around, we get an improvement. But bandwidth is actually really important, especially in content creation, because a lot of things like filters um, and different types of uh, concurrent applications all have to usually reside actively in memory. Usually when you have a, an active workflow, it's all residing inside of system memory. The faster that that memory is running, the better the performance that we have. So DDR4 starts off at a minimum of 2133, which is what we're using. We've got these uh, really nice uh, crucial DIMMs. These are 2133. Uh, these are eight gigabyte DIMMs. So as a total, we're gonna be putting 64 gigs worth of memory into this system. Yeah, that's a, uh, you know, that's always a, a, a tricky part too, is it, um, you know, sometimes because of the way that it seats in, some individuals, when they go in, they will press one side more than the other and they'll think it's seated in. So if you notice, I always will put fingers at both sides into press to make sure that the that the dim is fully seated. And how much are you putting in? Uh, this is 64 gigs. Wow. So we've got quite a bit of memory uh, yeah. for this platform. And on top of that, it's DDR4. So like I said, this these crucial 2133 dims, uh, they're really great in terms of their overall stability and their quality. Plus we've got just a huge amount of bandwidth opportunity on here and they've even got room. Like I said, if we wanted to get if we wanted to get interesting and we wanted to push them a little bit, we could do that very easily. All right. The variable pump. It's the first time they've put in a variable pump, so it's quieter, which I like. Normally, uh, air cooling solutions can be the quietest because there's no pump, and the fans can, of course, be very, very tuned. But this one has a variable pump, which I like. The thing you kind of have to keep in mind when you when you're putting together a system is really what's the what's the work that you're gonna do on it. Um, you know, like for gamers, take for instance, is the CPU can be very important, but to a degree the graphics card will be significantly more important. So a larger amount of actually the, the budget that you have, regardless of whether it's an entry level budget or a higher budget, should go into the graphics card. And you, but you still wanna ensure that you have a reasonable CPU. Uh, same thing, an SSD to a gamer, I find it, unequivocally you have to have one but um, it doesn't generally impact frame rate so performance isn't actually improved um, but in let's say a content creation system everything always at the end of the day can be CPU limited so a CPU I think it plays an extremely large part in, in part of this a uh, storage rate can be very important if you're leasing with like large density and high bit rate based files so that can play relevancy and the same thing with memory but it all depends on uh, the workflows that are being done, but you definitely want to balance it out between storage to memory to the CPU to all those components But there is no perfect answer if you're a Lightroom user versus a Premiere user Guess what are entirely different in terms of how they're threaded and how you can benefit from one processor versus memory or from the storage array configuration So you have to kind of balance each one out Um, I don't think there's really a weakest link. I mean this is about the fastest CPU you can get and the memory I think is a perfect density for the workflow but you know these crucial mx 100s are actually really really great drives they have really really good read and write consistency performance um, they're extremely large so they give us a huge amount of workspace but i'd probably say opening up the complexity of how we would define the storage array gives us better potential performance at how we can leverage the workflow in different situations um, so that's probably where I'd say if we had a couple of more drives to configure in a couple of ways, especially with this motherboard where we have SAT Express, we have M.2, which is a new very ultra high speed interconnect uh, that's faster than even single base SSDs. Um, we can do a lot of really interesting things at making sure that we can leverage storage for the right scenarios, whether it's for scratch disks or whether it's for the primary application base or whether it's for the operating system or segmenting different things out. I think that's an area, but the board's got more enough flexibility to find that. But right now, I think we have a very good platform, but that's an area that we could probably improve upon. There's not necessarily like a wrong way to do it. Uh, there's more optimal ways to do it. And that's really kind of what we're trying to target is if uh, we take a look at our motherboard, uh, the motherboard has what's referred to as a, a VRM. So this is the voltage regulation. So this is probably the hottest part running part of the motherboard. Um, and especially under content creation loads where you have very, very high CPU utilization, this part will load up and it will actually heat up quite a bit. Um, we've got some really high grade components here, so we don't have to worry as much on thermals. It's one of the better aspects of getting better spec boards that also have larger heat sinks. But what we wanna do is 
The two debates would be one would be an exhaust characteristic, which would be to set up the fan so they pull the hair, the hot air, and they would pull outwards. Mm -hmm. The other approach would be an intake, so we would bring the cold air from the surrounding area and we would bring that and directly actually cool that. Now, um, there's two differences of opinions. In our actually thermal analysis, though, we find that intake airflow actually works best, especially for these high-end type of situations. It's not an exhaust. The exhaust, the amount of heat that you're exhausting is actually, it's minimal. You don't get that much of an overall improvement to the VRM assembly. Bringing in that significant cool air directly over the VRM assembly, though, it really helps actually give you much, much, much better temperature performance. And we're still going to have the back chassis fan in an exhaust configuration, though. So that will help us to go ahead and any buildup of essentially hot air that is occurring will still be brought outwards of the chassis. So we're going to bring cool in air from the top. We're going to exhaust it out through the back. And then for the front, the front will also have front intake. So we're going to bring cool air from the front of the chassis. That'll help to bring over across our motherboard, over across our graphics card. And even the power supply will actually configure in a way that we'll help to bring in air to the GPU. But overall, that's the way that we're focusing. And this is also benefit benefit of selecting the chassis that we have uh, configured. Um, because we have actually that positive airflow coming in, it will also naturally exhaust out where you can see we have this uh, uh, venting that's built into the chassis, which also helps us to go ahead and exhaust outwards. So that's pretty much the way that we're going to be uh, setting up our airflow. Yeah. So the cooler, yeah, the cooler that we've gone with, this is actually a pretty brand new cooler. This is what's referred to as a closed loop cooling solution. Some people refer to this as kind of a water cooling unit. It's not a complete water cooling unit in the sense that it's got, uh, you know, a custom pump reservoir, radiator, and everything that you would manually set up and do uh, because it's pretty much already been set up and performed for you. But this is an ultra large, it's a 240 millimeter. We can see that we've got two large fans here. This is from NZXT, it's their Kraken X61. This is a very high performance unit, but it's got very large diameter fans, which helps to keep this very cool, but also very quiet, which I think is a key target. Uh, we don't want our system to be loud, but we want it to be cool. And it gives us actually a lot of margin um, because we've got a K part, if we want to auto overclock or we want to manually overclock we've got that ability to be able to go ahead and do that um, it also has a new feature called a variable pump and that allows actually the pump to change in terms of its speed so it allows it to be a lot quieter in terms of its operation and it's even got flexible hosing compared to earlier generation closed loop cooling solutions these were sometimes um, very rigid and so they were hard to go ahead and kind of sometimes mount and swing into different directions and that actually makes a good point uh, when you go about installing this you can actually install this in two ways so if we were to go and put this up here what you kind of want to do is almost pretend and say, hey, if I mounted my solution, how is this going to look when I put my motherboard in? And you can see right there, I can kind of picture it and I can go, okay, that way works. Um, now, if you were to orientate it the other way, the reason why you might not want to do that is because you can see that depending on the fan or depending maybe on the motherboard and what is extruding over in the back I.O. section, this could potentially cause an obstruction. So we're going to go ahead and orient it, orientate it the way that I originally showed you guys. This is going to be this way. Well, it, 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 does, it doesn't necessarily matter in terms of like whether you place it, how you rotate it, like 90 degrees, 180 degrees. Um, but where it can actually affect you is in cable routing. If you think about that oh, actually yes. in the very beginning, then when you route that cable, you more you want to have it more centrally focused. So if you notice, what I ideally would like to do is have that cable, uh, you know, let's say here in the middle. And so then when I go ahead and put it back there, when I route it through, it's going to come down to actually where the CPU uh, headers are. And so you can try to balance that out. And you can imagine if like you would set up the, the fans where you had the cables at opposing ends, sometimes when you go to strand it to the right place, it might be yeah. longer than you'd like it to be. So, you know, the other, the other tricky part too with these closed booting is that you always want to make sure to line up the threads correct because sometimes since you can't see the bottom portion yes, what you can end up doing is you can actually thread into the radiator the newer cpu cooling solutions have the option so if you look at this one you see that you see how it's got like all these fan headers yep that's because they want you to connect the fans to this to control it through the cpu cooler so sometimes people get confused do i plug the fans into the cpu cooler or am i supposed to plug it into the motherboard Right, and we're actually gonna plug everything into the motherboard. Uh, the reason why we recommend that solution is because one is that every single fan header on the board can be controlled, um, but also it eliminates you having to go through different points to be able to configure different fans, 
right? So whether you wanna control the CPU fans, the back fan, the intake fan, whatever fans you want the ability to, you're gonna be able to control them in the operating system or even in the UEFI if you don't even wanna use software to calibrate and control them. Well, the, the biggest difference you're gonna have generally with the Quadro series to a standard GPU is, is that under certain conditions, uh, the Quadro GPUs have what's referred to as ISV certification. So for ISV certification, that means that the driver set is optimized uh, for potentially maybe better quality uh, in some applications. This is generally more important for programs that do rendering through the graphics card mm -hmm. as opposed to just receive pure acceleration. So like in Premiere, you generally don't actually, although with After Effects, that's, there's, there's some possibility that that could be a little bit different, but um, you generally are more okay picking a standard like GeForce card as opposed to a Quadro card because uh, you're doing more necessarily uh, acceleration than you are pure rendering. But it depends once again on the application. But that's kind of one of the differences is that if you're, I guess, trying to have the, the absolute best potential performance under on any type of scenario, then yes, ideally you would want to probably incorporate a Quadro, but also the, the Quadro cards uh, can go up significantly in cost compared to a standard GeForce card. But part of that is because of that ISV certification. What they do is they actually, they tune the driver as well as even what's called the, uh, the BIOS for the card to be specific to those programs. Um, well, not an SLI because actually Adobe, um, and actually as far as I'm aware of, no general video editing application can acknowledge SLI. Um, so it's a question of acceleration. So the program has to be able to acknowledge two separate GPUs, which can be uh, done in terms of um, an acceleration card, but it's not a question that the cards would work in a paired configuration. So that's why that, that, that Maximus configuration is a little bit different. It's not a, a normal two GPU pairing, which is kind of historically talked about in the community. Like if you bought like two GTX 760s, right. that's an SLI configuration, which is purely only for the gaming segmentation. Um, for the content creation community, that configuration would never work. So that's why you have to utilize a Quadro in that Maximus configuration, because ah. it's about the card being recognized as a secondary point for acceleration, as opposed to in SLI for gaming purposes that actually they combine the two cards together to work as a single card to improve gaming performance. And um, not every single application is, is GPU accelerated. And so that's what, you know, Nvidia and Adobe are continually working on to try to improve because some, that's where when we get back to that original question of a balanced system, it's very important to have a balanced system because the CPU will always, always be accelerated. It is always a baseline. So regardless of anything that you have, the faster that you have, a, the faster CPU and the more threads that you have, you're always going to be guaranteed improved performance. Whereas the GPU is very conditional. If the yeah. if the effect or the filter or yeah. that specific portion of the program doesn't have acceleration, you don't get a benefit. And the other thing is that um, graphics cards have a very different nature in terms of they have parallel based processing designs, and that's important from the perspective that the way that things get accelerated or get improved upon, there's not uh, linear improvements in terms of how um, how GPUs improve upon. Like, um, mm, mm, I would say it actually depends on your player. Um, not everybody knows, but your player heavily depends that. Um, different players have different types of acceleration policies. Um, so like Windows Media Player by default has actually built-in video acceleration. So it will automatically use your graphics card by default to accelerate your graphics performance and offload your CPU. But if you go into a different program, like some people might use like VLC because it's really codec friendly for a lot of different things. Yeah, nice, um, VLC. And if you use VLC, you can actually set it to play back in both uh, software modes or hardware modes. If you do software mode though, uh, then it will use your CPU. But um, in some situations, it would be, that, I, that wouldn't be recommended because it would, be significantly more impacting to your CPU than it would be to use the fixed function decoding of your GPU. So if you can, you always want to use hardware playback acceleration. Although in some rare situations, some codecs, some containers, you know, they're, they're a little bit goofy. And so in some situations, you actually do need to disable hardware acceleration to have the, um, the file playback correctly. These actually, these NZXT fans are very, very good. They've got very good bearings. Um, and their RPM range as well as their decibel ratings are actually, um, most of them I believe are between 24 to 21 dB. Um, but actually I'll tell you a really important thing. A lot of people, uh, Noctua make really great quality fans 
and they make a very good quality cooling solutions as well. Um, but probably even more important than a fan is fan control functionality. In many situations, um, a fan that has a higher RPM range and therefore a higher decibel range can easily be managed to be a quiet and very uh, smooth operating fan and something that you're gonna not find um, audibly kind of frustrating to you or annoying if you have the ability to calibrate it correctly and profile it so that you can easily tune it. And so a lot of people undervalue their ability to be able to um, tune the fan. If you've got good fan controls, and just about any fan you can actually make run well. Um, most fans that are currently on the market are of uh, such a consistent quality as far as their baseline that uh, what you really just need to be able to target to do is hopefully be able to get the operating range between about 900 to about 1200 RPM. And once you're within that zone, you're gonna be pretty quiet, but still maintaining a good amount of CFM. It's got the isolated sound design. Isolated sound design? Yeah, so uh, something that we developed um, around the same time that you that that board got originally designed was an entirely new sound design implementation so historically when you look at a motherboard the sound portion oh, right okay yeah it's on a it's on a shared PCB right they're okay. all, it's all on the same thing but you might be able to see it a little bit here from the back hey you see see right there see that cutout I'm getting focused. Okay, go ahead. So you say it's kind of like a little yellow yep. kind of line. That's actually its own full independent layer. So the sound section of the motherboard, so the audio codec is entirely independent of the rest of the motherboard. So you don't get actually crosstalk. Those are actually sprinkled all throughout the motherboard along with right next to them. Those are actually anti-surge and anti um, ESD based diodes. Okay. So even the motherboard itself, higher quality boards have built in protection mechanisms because we don't know, we don't ever know what's going to be in between us and the wall. Yeah. So we always even try to implement that. And that's really important for even things like this, this portion, which is the storage array, because if you get like a brownout or surge or spike that comes in, it can hit the PCH. And then if you have a connected drive, the drive then can get damaged. So uh, we build in a lot of secondary fail saves uh, that are built into the board for that. You're counterbalancing it. Yeah, yeah, except we're pretty much uh, kind of just going a little bit from everywhere. And the main thing is we don't want to over torque this. Uh, it's much harder with this platform, Socket 2011, because the way it's designed, you can't, especially with there's no, when there's no back plate, mm -hmm. it's much harder to over torque it. But same thing. The goal here is really is a solid finger tight. It's not. Let me, how much can I crank each screw down because we don't want to cause any pin and pin, excuse me, pin and pad contact issues. Kind of oh no, yeah, we actually definitely do. You actually, a lot of a lot of content creators have the bad habit that they love to use their uh, desktop as their work area. So they've got, you know, usually, usually, you know, especially the the higher the resolution and the bigger the desktop, there tends to be the more icons, right? Right. Um, but you know, when your system loads up, Windows actually has to address every single one of those icons as a searchable or indexable base file. So folders are really actually your friend. So it is actually a legitimate point. If you can begin to kind of compartmentalize your files and at least put them inside folders, that does help. And there's also even another option within Windows. Um, it has a, what's called an isolated memory management option mm -hmm. where you can go into Windows and set every folder to open up in a new memory uh, essentially in a new instance of memory. The reason why that's advantageous is a lot of content creators also have the tendency that they will run, you know, a, a huge amount of programs all at the same time. Um, and the last thing you want is your files to be sharing the same space as a program. Because if one program ha potentially has a lockup or has an issue or something like that, and you have it sitting in the same space, you can run into a problem. So that's also another uh, way that you can kind of deal with that. But, you know, to a degree, while a lot of SSDs get measured sequentially, the biggest benefit actually comes from their, what are called their IOPS, so their instructions per second. Um, SSDs actually have exponentially better small file performance than hard drives. Um, this is probably something that's more so, it really depends again on the workflow. But for photographers, um, you could, if you monitored some of that stuff, I would say that, again, you'd still be better serviced by an SSD than a mechanical hard drive. Um, and, it, and actually in your situation, while a green drive isn't a bad choice, I think a, a standard rotating mechanical hard drive would have been a better choice just because the cantilever, the axis isn't so variable because with a, a more eco-based drive, it's specifically designed to bring down the RPM occasionally. Okay. Um, so 
actually for low consistent writes, even though they're very small, you'd actually want the disc almost more ready okay. to be able to take on those those writes consistently. But at the end of the day, if it, if it fits within your, if, if you notice it's not impacting your workflow, it's okay. The better the quality of the power supply um, can directly relate to other things outside of pure wattage. So one is, you know, build quality and topology is an important characteristic, is that as you scale up, you're gonna get better quality electronics, which actually help to ensure that whatever the wattage is that you're buying, you actually get. So that's a given. Um, the second one though might be things like the fan curves. Um, more entry level power supplies, probably they don't tune the fan curve at all. And so it could be that the fan is always running. So of course, if we wanna keep a quieter system, then that's gonna be another benefit. But when you get into wattage, one important thing is also is trying, you know, there's two different ways to build. You're either building exactly for the system you have or for the system that you may have, right? And so you of course sometimes wanna buffer in uh, maybe a little bit of more uh, wattage so that if you add in more drives, maybe possibly more memory, you add an SSD, um, you know, those different type of configurations, each thing adds a little bit more. Um, overclocking is something that I don't think you have enabled on your system, but it can exponentially increase power consumption as well. Um, if we talk about this part, this new part from Intel is rated at 140 TDP, so it's a 140 watt part. Um, overclocking the part though could easily put the CPU into 220 to 240 watt territory. Um, so you can see that just by not changing our system, but by overclocking for better performance though, you know, we would want a better power supply. The other thing is that power supplies themselves degrade in terms of their actual power output capability every year. They will go down incrementally, and incrementally, and incrementally. People's perception that they buy that power supply and it stays at a fixed power output capability from day one, um, that's incorrect. Now, the level of how much it may degrade, that could be minor, so it could be a bit more, and it all depends on what you do with the power supply. Um, there's also ambient temperature. Ambient temperature directly correlates to the operating efficiency of the power supply. And that translates into like the 80 plus ratings. So generally the better the rating, the PSU, the, the more stringent the tolerance it has and even the higher ambient level that it can perform at. So like, you know, gold and platinum series PSUs, you know, usually they can reach their, um, their wattage outputs at even very, very high temperatures. So even in hot environments, they're not bringing that down. So there's a lot of different things, you know, overall I tell most people for even a, a moderate to kind of high end enthusiast system, uh, a silver to a gold 750 watt is probably going to entirely take care of you and still give you kind of headroom. Um, so that's going to be okay. 1000 watt really is more so for situations where I would probably say you're definitely overclocking and you've got a high level of expansion that's integrated into the system. Um, more than that really becomes very conditionally specific. You would have to really have that much extra hardware in the system. Um, but definitely don't undercut on the quality, you know, like the PSU we're using right here, this is an NZXT, it's, um, it's a 90 plus gold uh, and it's a thousand watts. So it's got a lot of extra headroom, but also because, you know, we, we're putting in some fairly high end parts as far as, you know, we've got pretty much the flagship CPU, we've got a ton amount of memory, we've got a GPU, just those under full load, um, altogether, we would probably easily be looking at, you know, probably about 500 watts in terms of the pool. So having, you know, that extra kind of headroom, it's nice to have, but it really just depends on what you're doing with the system. Cool. So when you're building and even as you use your system or if you overclock is that you can be pulling an extremely high amount of current um, through the actual contacts, specifically the CPU contact, not so much the motherboard contact because this doesn't pull too much. The CPU is what pulls too a, a lot. So when you actually make the connection for your CPU power uh, from the power supply to here, you really wanna make sure that that is very snug and clean connection because if it's actually weak over time, that can actually cause an issue. And you, you could even get actually uh, temperature bit related issues but that could burn the socket. Um, uh, it depends on how much you're actively pulling at stock. It's a far lower likelihood, but even at stock, you, you really want to keep that in mind. Uh, for guys that kind of even want to be super, super careful, if you've got a hot glue gun, uh, it's actually really, it, it, it's actually, it's a really good option because a lot of times when people uh, do cable routing, when they pull the cable so taut, what happens is sometimes you can end up inadvertently yeah. slightly pulling it out and it's not as, it's not snug. as snug. Um, so if you really kind of just want to make sure it's in pace, you just put a little bead in there keeps in place and you're good to go. Wow. And it's very easy, you know, that if you do need to take it out, you just pop the little, you know, hot glue on and that's it, you're wow. good to go. Yeah, well, part of that's useless. because, well, it, it depends on what you're using it for. Like yeah. if it's a mechanical hard drive, it's, it's fine. It's exactly the same performance. Yeah. And even in an SSD, actually, if you measure the real performance, it's gonna be almost identical. But if you benchmark it, the sequential throughput will be noticeably different. But that's because the PCI link 
to that controller is only a what's called buy one link. So there's overhead based on the link to a controller. So if it's under a certain amount, it can't fully saturate it. Um, whereas the Intel has its own kind of insured bandwidth link. So go ahead and point them out what they are. So we've got two, four, six, eight, and then we have four more here. So we've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. So that's a total of 12 SATA ports. Wow. Um, the Intel chipset for this generation, actually there's 10 SATA 6G built inherently into the chipset, but for this board, uh, it's been a little bit customized to give you the most level of flexibility. So one, there's this new standard, which is called M.2. Okay. So M.2 is faster than any other form of connection, except for this one down here, which is also new, um, because it's not linked into the normal sub storage. This is actually linked in directly into PCI Express. So it is an ultra high bandwidth. Um, this is a by four interconnect. So this can offer, you know, you could be talking easily you know, four times the speed of a normal SATA 6G based SSD. Um, so you can get very, very fast, ultra high performance based SSDs that literally just plug into that slot. Um, has standard based SSDs or mechanical hard drives would plug into here. Um, but then down here, we have four ports that either can serve as SATA 6G ports or also can serve as two of the new SATA Express. So SATA Express is the replacement specification for standard SATA. So this offers 10 gigabits Normal SATA offers six gigabits, and this also offers 10 gigabits. So this board actually comes with every single um, specification that exists right now for high speed based storage. You've got the M.2, Serial ATA, and SATA Express. And of course, if you use a PCI based SSD, you've got tons of PCI based SSD connectivity. Okay, so uh, we're just doing a quick test post. Um, this is usually not a bad idea anyways, once you kind of got the primary amount of the systems put in just to get an idea to see that the system actually fires on before you get to the end. And definitely before you were to put on any side panels or anything, that's the number one rule. Don't ever put on anything and then expect to turn on the power <laughs> button. Always at some kind of, I'd say, 40 to 50 percent in into the build uh, if you've got everything connected go ahead and do a test fire just to see if uh, the system actually comes on so we're gonna go ahead and do that now I'm not gonna um, let it run for actually a very long period of time because I don't even have yet the, the fan headers yeah. connected for this okay. now the boiler board does actually have an automatic fail safe so that if the temperature actually gets too it'll hot it. it'll automatically cut it cool. all I'm interested in right now is actually just seeing if the yeah. system actually triggers on though and numbers. that's it yeah it's already sequencing through the post um, and actually this is what's called training and posting so power on self tests so that's what I'm mainly interested in I just wanted to see that the memory training and the posting process is going through and actually it looks exactly like it needs to and our board actually has these little diagnostic LEDs you probably saw one pop up right yep. there there's four of them there's one for the CPU there's one for the memory there's one for the graphic and there's one for the boot device so I've actually seen them all sequence on and I continue to see this actual training go through so I know that actually it's okay so at this point I'm gonna go ahead and shut it off and then from there continue to go ahead and connect the rest of the key the key cables so that's pretty much it. I'll have parts two and three done whenever I get a chance. Um, but I thought this would be some really good content for you guys. All right, talk to you guys later. Bye.